I wonder if you could talk a little bit about computational reducibility. When you apply rules to the hypergraph, you have to commit the computational resources to do exactly that. You have to apply the rules one by one to the hypergraph and all its complexity. With computational irreducibility, there, there's basically no simplifications you can make. You, you just have to do the computation from beginning to end to work out how the universe is going to evolve. But we know that there are simplifications we can make. You know, there is computational reducibility in our universe. For example, you know, we know that general relativity, which is a beautifully simple theory of space and time, holds in our universe. So, so there is computational reducibility. So how do you think about computational reducibility? Yeah, it's really interesting because this is a topic on which my opinion has changed quite radically over the oh, last okay. couple of years. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, computational irreducibility is a concept that I've been fascinated in for a while, precisely because, as you say, it kind of gets to the heart of what is possible in theoretical science, right? Because, yeah. you know, if, if we think of processes in nature as performing computations, then, you know, our theoretical scientific models are, you know, correspond to precisely this, the cases where there exists reducibility. And everything that, and, you know, the idea that was put forward in NKS is that essentially the abstract phenomenon of complexity we can think of as being associated to the situation where it is irreducible, where we, where we effectively we have the only option available to us as theoretical scientists is, is to explicitly simulate every step. It's not like we can be very clever and write some yeah. equation that kind of spits out the answer, right? Because it's, because it's fundamentally irreducible. So that, you know, certainly used to be my view. And I, you know, I, wrote, I wrote some papers, kind of even pre-physics project, trying to kind of formalize different notions of irreducibility and figure out what they might imply for physical systems and so on. And I certainly used to have this view that, okay, it must be the case that things like general relativity or quantum mechanics are essentially situations where there somehow exists reducibility you know, in this what is otherwise an ocean of kind of irreducible behavior. I kind of don't have that view anymore. And the reason is because what turns out to be the case in the, in the context of the physics project is actually sort of the opposite. So, okay, to make that a little bit less cryptic, let me make the analogy to fluid mechanics. So when you've got a very large collection of discrete molecules bouncing around, right? As you add more and more molecules to the system, obviously the problem of like how you, how you, how you simulate it, how you predict what that system is going to do, seems to get more and more difficult, right? That we, we certainly don't have, a, if you've just got a collection of gas molecules in a box and they're you know, interacting with perfectly elastic collisions or something, we don't have some clever formula that you can just write down that tells you exactly where every molecule is going to be in that box after, after 100 iterations. You basically have to simulate it, as far as we know. Yeah. You can, you know, you can write down coarse-grained things. You can, you can write down things like partition functions. You can write down the Boltzmann equation. You can make statements about, like, what's the probability that a, that a molecule will be in some region of the box for some period yeah. of time, those kinds of things. But the, the microscopic details of where is every molecule going to be, that, as far as we know, is irreducible. And that, that irreducibility has an implication. It, 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 it implies what in fluid dynamics or molecular physics is called the molecular chaos assumption. That basically that it is unpredictable, right? Yes. And in particular that you have what's called ergodicity, that effectively that there's like no net, you know, there's kind of, uh, one way you could think about ergodicity is there's like there's no net movement of molecules in any one direction, right? If you if you yeah. if you placed some uh, some surface in the in the box, right, the net flux of molecules through that surface, whatever you know, wherever you place that surface, as time goes on, that net flux is going to be zero. Yeah. And and that ergodicity hypothesis, as it's called. That assumption of that, that that or that assumption of molecular chaos is made credible by the fact that the molecular dynamics is irreducible is irreducibly complicated. If it were yeah. reducible, if they, if it was if it behaved in some in some predictable way, it would be much less plausible that the molecular chaos assumption would be true. Yeah. Okay. But that's really significant because it's precisely the molecular chaos assumption that allows us a to make these statements about partition functions and Boltzmann equations and stuff like that. But actually, if we take that even further. It's the thing that eventually allows us to derive the equations of fluid dynamics, right? We, yeah. we know that if you have enough of these particles and they're all interacting in some complicated way, that there's a very coarse description of it in terms of a continuous gas or a continuous fluid or a continuous solid or, you know, uh, or a, cont a continuous liquid or a continuous solid. And there's a mathematical procedure by which you can, you can do that coarse graining. You basically, you know, you write down the one particle distribution function of the Boltzmann equation and you do this fancy thing called the chapman enskog expansion that is really just a kind of coarse graining procedure by which you can derive then the stress tensor that appears in the continuum mechanics equations. Yeah. So in effect, the fact that we can make bulk statements about continuous fluids based on discrete molecular behavior, you know, bulk statements like the Navier-Stokes equations or the Euler equations or, or you know, the, the, the equations of solid mechanics, that, the fact that we're able to do that 
is a consequence of the molecular chaos assumption. It's a consequence of ergodicity, and therefore, yeah. by extension, I would argue a consequence of computational irreducibility. So you have this slightly paradoxical situation where precisely because the underlying behavior is irreducible, you can make reducible statements about its coarse-grained properties. Note, right. <laughs> it's, it's very important to note that the behavior is still completely irreducible, right? The, yeah. the, something like the navier stokes equations or the Euler equations certainly don't allow you to make statements about you know, the positions of individual yes. molecules. That is still completely unknown and would require arbitrary amounts of computational effort to, 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 to determine. But somehow, because it's, precisely because it's chaotic, because it's irreducible, because it's complex, you can make large-scale coarse grain statements that are still meaningful, about, not about quantities of, at the level of individual molecules, but about these very coarse quantities like densities, pressures, temperatures, velocities, etc. Okay. So, as a consequence of the work that we've done on the physics project, I've now, you know, the conclusion that I've resoundingly come to is that general relativity and quantum mechanics are much more like that, right? They are, it's not that they correspond to cases where the laws of physics are, the, the, the underlying mac microscopic laws of physics are reducible. It's rather that they are a consequence of irreducibility, meaning that we can make coarse grain statements that are still meaningful, right? Because neither quantum mechanics nor general relativity in, in, the, in the way that they're formulated in the Wolfram model are statements about, are microscopic statements. They're not statements about individual hypernodes or hyperedges. They're not statements about individual configurations of subhypergraphs or whatever. Because my, you know, I, I think it's safe to say that those things in general will certainly be irreducible. That yeah. if you wanted to make micro statements about individual hypernodes, you would have to do arbitrary amounts of computation. The point is, general relativity makes statements about concepts like curvature and dimension. Yeah which are concepts that only become well-defined when you're taking very large collections of hypernodes, very large pieces, sections of hypergraph that you're then coarse-graining out over and, and using them to make kind of effectively continuum statements. And the same is true of quantum mechanics, right? In quantum mechanics, you're never making statements about, well, we haven't really talked about multi-way systems, but maybe this is a good, a good time to start. Right? <laughs> yeah. But you're not making statements about individual state vertices or individual branches of the, of the multi-way system. If our formulation yeah. of quantum mechanics in the Wolfram model is correct, you're only ever making very coarse, large-scale statements about whole branchial graphs, whole branchial surfaces. Yeah, yeah. So the same is, the same is true there. And so I think what, what's going on is actually much more analogous to fluid mechanics than it is to kind of conventional computational reducibility. It's that physics, the, and again, this is, this is now less of a scientific statement and more of like a statement about the history of physics, you know, because of, I would argue that because of computational irreducibility, physics has, forced, has been forced to have its most general, to have its most foundational theories be formulated in terms of things that we can make coarse grain statements about that, that yeah. somehow therefore avoid that irreducibility in the same way that fluid mechanics only makes coarse grain statements about densities and pressures. General relativity yeah. only makes coarse grain statements about curvatures and dimension. Quantum mechanics only makes coarse grain statements about amplitudes and probabilities. And that's really an example, of, I, I would argue, of this you know, coarse graining an irreducible system can give you reducible laws. That's fascinating. So it, it's almost completely the other way around than what I described, that instead of general relativity and quantum mechanics being examples of computational reducibility, they're actually consequences of computational irreducibility. I think so, yeah. I mean, the, the, the view you articulated was the view that if you'd asked me three years yes. ago, I would have said the same thing, right? But it's, yeah. as I say, it's, a, it's a, something I've changed my mind on quite radically over the last couple of years. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast, or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.